Discover hope and healing from the other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode. Every time I hear those words, it inspires me. They're all around you. That's what we're going to talk about today, but not specifically our loved ones in spirit, but the higher beings, the masters, and how people who have no idea that masters even exist can connect with them. My guest is a testament to that. My guest today is Mary Reed. We first heard of each other, I believe, when I was speaking at a Unity Church in Texas, but our paths kept crossing, and Mary recently reached out, and we connected again, and I read her first book, which we're going to be talking about today, and then a little bit about her new book, which I haven't read yet, and her story, which is phenomenal, and you will come to feel her energy, which I was just telling her I can feel, and I know that she is the real deal as far as someone who channels higher messages, higher truths, higher beings. So we'll get into her background as we go. For those of you listening live on the radio or later in the archives on radio, I also will be posting this to my YouTube channel so you can get the visuals later if you'd like. But for now, no matter how you're perceiving this, welcome Mary Reed. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for this invitation. You are welcome. Now, I'm going to get off topic right away and jump into something that I need to know, because I told you when you came on the camera, I was a bit startled because I've seen pictures of you in your book. I've seen pictures of you on your website, and it was hard for me not to be surprised that you are sitting here with no hair. You shaved your head, and I was a bit (laughs) Tentative at first, because I thought maybe you were sick and going through treatment, but you said, no, you've been doing this for years and there's a story. Let's jump into the story of why you did that. Okay, well, uh, you'll hear it later on when I tell a little bit of my background. There was a point in my uh, normal world, I used to be a healthcare executive, and uh, I was an agnostic and, you know, I had sort of this normal professional executive life in Washington, D.C., and there came a point where, because of some this spiritual life that was really trying to make itself known within me, all of my normal world just crashed spectacularly. And part of what crashed was my income. And so I ran out of money. And one day I was in the shower and I had been living, you know, a life of highlights and nice haircuts and all that sort of stuff. And my hair was getting long and I needed a haircut and I thought, oh my God, it would just be so much easier if I could just shave this off and not have to worry about the money. And then I thought, well, I'm a grown adult. I could just shave it off if I wanted to. So I got out of the shower. I got my dog clippers and I shaved my head. And then the moment that I looked in the mirror, I was like, oh my word, what have I done? So immediately there was all of this awareness about self-acceptance and what does beauty mean and what does this mean now for me in the world so then a few minutes later I had to go to CVS and when I walked in like watching everybody's reaction to me just based on my hair so there was the nervousness right off the bat just like you that people thought I was sick so there was a little bit of pity and then some people would realize I don't think she's sick I think that was just a rebellious act and then that would be a little bit threatening to them and so people were there was this awkward engagement and so then I realized my own presence with other people and how to put people at ease and you know how am I showing up with this with my own self so there were all these lessons that came out of it and then just about a year later coincidentally or or not uh, I ended up uh, living in a Buddhist nunnery in the Himalayas. This I'll remind you, I was agnostic at the time when that happened. But I ended up living in a Buddhist nunnery where all the women shaved their head. So then we could all talk about our shared experiences of as a woman, what it means to like walk in the world in a very different way than it's expected. So it's given me way more lessons than I ever anticipated. And and I got to say, it's a much easier way of life. (laughs) It definitely would be easier. It would be cheaper. But I'm, I'm curious, did the women, the other women in the nunnery shave their heads for religious reasons or also because it was convenient? 
No, they shave theirs for religious region reasons. Okay. Yeah. And, and I just, I walked in the door and fit right in. Wow. What are those reasons? Um, I think it is that uh, there's a lack of distraction and uh, uh, a lack of focus on external, you know, engagement with the world. And that includes beauty standards and things like that. I don't actually know a lot, but um, again, we focused on, in my conversations with the nuns, we focused so much on just what the impact was uh, from an from an, uh, learning to be authentic in yourself oh. without, you know, sort of sense of adornment or that sort of thing. So it was really, really quite powerful. It is powerful. And, I'm, and I hope you don't mind me taking so much time here in the show to talk about it because I'm just so impressed. I am not at a place where I could do that. I wouldn't want to do that. Yet I'm so impressed that you overcame the ego. You're honoring the self. And I have to tell you, when you said that you can put people at ease just by being your authentic self, I experienced that heart to heart connection and my heart just opened. It was this surge of love right there that if we all saw each other with no adornments, that's all we have, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm always very conscious of putting people at ease because I'm aware of the way that I look. And in fact, when I first started touring um, and people knew that I lived in the nunnery, that I was a mystic, that I had all these experiences and I would come out originally, I was wearing like Indian clothing from the, you know, I, I lived in India for nearly seven years. So these beautiful custom made outfits or whatever. And I saw that people were extremely nervous meeting me and and they would literally like cry in the line waiting to, and then they were just shaking and nervous and I realized that so much of what that was doing just my appearance was creating a separation from them uh -huh. like instead of a you know an invitation to unite with me but a separation feeling like, like I was different or special in some way and the hair was definitely a big part of that so I stopped wearing the Indian clothing altogether and I usually, you know, acknowledge something about my hair, you know, that I was, you know, may have been a minute late because I had to do my hair or something. <laughs> like that. So people are aware, I know how I look and, uh, but it just, it, I find it a really great avenue um, now as kind of an equalizer in some ways. Wow. Well, let's now dive into how you changed over the years and why. Let's start, however, with a phrase you just used, you said, I tell people that I'm a mystic. What is your definition of a mystic? Um, oh, thank you very much for that question. That's really good because it can be very confusing. I can only speak about mysticism from my experience of it. Because I was an agnostic, I had no understanding of what that meant. I had no interest in what that meant. Um, I didn't grow up with big questions about life. I didn't go to church. I have no spiritual background at all. It's very um, familiar. That's my background. So I get it. Yeah. And, and I was quite comfortable with that. And, you know, there was no distraction of that kind of questions of life when I was doing executive work in healthcare. So, uh, but when uh, back in summer of 2000, I began having, I began hearing a voice. That's how this started. Uh, and that voice told me that I was supposed to be doing something very important. And so what opened this gate to this mystical journey was a voice that then turned into metaphysical experiences, these embodied experiences that were really weighty and profound, and we can talk more about that. But as they continued on and on and on, I was just having all of these very direct experiences with a higher sense of being. And so for me, a mystic or mysticism is direct engagement with divine beings or divine wisdom. Now, I recognize that some, for some people, the word mysticism is the search for that. Um, you know, a mystic is one that is in search of that wisdom. But for me, just speaking about it experientially, it is a direct engagement with that wisdom. wisdom. And that's the goal. What are your thoughts on the availability of that direct connection for anyone? Oh, I, I absolutely think it is. And actually, in, in preparation for our interview, I was thinking about um, how, you know, in your work, you connect people to loved ones um, who have passed. So you connect people across the veil. And I, my work, ultimately, after all of these years, which has now been about 21 years, ultimately, what I do now is actually lead people to the access to their own higher selves, their own um, 
the wisdom within, and it, that may be an ancient presence. It may be the personification of masters like Jesus or Buddha or those sorts of things. So in my work, that's what I do. I connect people innately to that ultimately, to, to realizing their own capacity to do this kind of thing. Right. And that is, is what that is, is. We share that greater mission as well, because all of my teaching is not just to be a medium, but anybody can have this connection, just like yes. you say. Yeah. yeah, it is. And I think that, you know, I, I talk about this kind of stuff in, not in terms of learning it, but remembering it because it's an innate thing within us, right? We've just forgotten over the years. And, you know, we didn't mean to. So in, in my work, there's always a great deal of compassion for the paths that we've taken and all that we've learned. And now all of that path leading in a very healing way back to our innate nature and our capabilities. Exactly. So tell us about your initial reaction to this voice speaking to you in the year 2000? Well, first of all, I was much too busy to listen to a phantom voice telling me that I was supposed to be doing something very important because I thought I was already doing something very important. <laughs> I was in clinical research in respiratory medicine, mostly in AIDS. And um, so, you know, what could be more important at that time in the world? This was the late 90s, 2000. It was summer 2000, actually. So I tried to ignore it. And it just, the more I tried to ignore it, the more persistent it became. And so it began showing up in meetings and on elevators and as I was driving. And it always said the exact same thing. You're supposed to be doing something very important. And I'll note that it wasn't like a voice that we think of. It was more like a vibration that was interpreted. I always talk about it, if you know the singer Barry White, when Barry White hits a bass note, there's like this after sound vibration that you can feel. That's what I was feeling within me with that message of uh, you're supposed to be doing something very important. And so I was really annoyed with it because it's like, well, what more, you know, who's talking to me and what do you want me to do? I don't understand this kind of stuff. And after about six months of that, I was uh, on Amelia Island, Florida. I had a conference. I had a big talk I had to give that day. I was running on the beach at sunrise thinking about this talk. And all of a sudden, I was just overwhelmed with this um, realization that I had forgotten something really important. And I knew immediately that it was connected to this voice. And I understood in that moment that either I had forgotten something, I had uh, forgotten to bring something very important into this world, or I brought it in and then forgot it. And neither of those scenarios made any sense to me because as an agnostic, I never thought about any other life than the one I was living. But to bring something in or leave something behind meant there had to be something else, right? So given the voice and given that really intense realization, I called a friend who was a psychotherapist in Little Rock, Arkansas and asked for some help. I needed to figure out what this was. So I flew to Little Rock. She put me under hypnosis and immediately the very first thing that happened was I went into the body and being of Jesus on the cross at the moment of crucifixion and in that moment I, I saw all of humanity's evolution and how we had evolved what happened at that particular point and then the evolution from that point forward all from that vantage point and learned all of this information over the course of three and a half hours and um, so that was my very first event was going into that really profound, weighty kind of experience. And then that just opened the gates. Then I began to have these kind of experiences again and again and again, just, you know, on my own or randomly. And they've continued ever since. Let's go really deep here. People hearing this might think, is she saying she is the reincarnation of Jesus? But what I hear and feel is that you were given that experience because all of us are pure consciousness, pure awareness, and are capable at deeper levels of experiencing ourselves as any aspect of consciousness that has ever been. What's your comment on that? I mean, you just said it. That's really well said. Um, you know, in my experience, because I, I speak about things in two terms, separation consciousness, that which believes we're separate from this thing that we call God, that which believes we're separate from the life force that's giving us life experience itself, right? This thing that, that doesn't understand that we are 
not just connected to, but we are the flow of divine love. We right? are. So it's, they're the separation consciousness, and then there's a unitive consciousness. And in unitive consciousness, that's all there is, is union, right? There's the awareness of everything in union. But in separation consciousness, we have a personification of things that we need to perceive as other, right? In a unit of consciousness, we don't have to be other. We can be in and as because it's a union experience. It's an experience of all that. So in my going into the body and being of Jesus on the cross at the moment of crucifixion was my experience going into what we would specifically call Christ consciousness, right? To view life from that vantage point. But it was through the personification of a body that we could understand, a being that we could understand. So it wasn't, there isn't the claiming of being of Jesus. It's the experience of Christ consciousness through that, that body or that being. And this is how all, you know, I've done this the same with going into Buddha, the, the mind of Buddha at his moment of uh, enlightenment, his mo first moment of enlightenment. And so then understanding what people talk about in terms of Buddha nature, and, you know, these are, so I experience it in many, many different kinds of ways, oftentimes not personified, but more just in a, a you know, a greater, like a source, we could call it, you know, people talk about the universe or source. Um, so I experience it in all different kinds of ways. And I think it's important um, to be able to do that, realizing that some people can't hear the language of Christ. Some people can't hear the language of Buddha. So understanding from a global universal perspective, what is it that's, that can be spoken about in all of these various different ways? And in my language, it's just love. It's just we all will the different we will versions definitely of love. Come back to that. But along the, the story of Mary, from that point of view, were you, after that initial hypnosis experience, were you spontaneously having these experiences of merging with higher beings and now it's controlled? You can merge with others with intention? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. And, uh, and I think the first experience I had outside after the, the hypnosis sessions was an experience of oneness. I was on the island of St. John. I was really deeply depressed because um, I had been in this glorious field. There was actually a second day to that hypno hypnotherapy thing, which also went back into divine beings and divine realms. And uh, so having all of those exquisite, wise, caring, loving experiences, and then coming back to this very cruel and complicated world, especially in DC, it was really hard for me to balance those two things. And so I was at another conference and... Uh, in St. Thomas, and I'd gone over to the island of St. Kitts. I was sad, I was crying, I was walking up the hills, and I was just like, I don't understand. Why was I given this beautiful experience and I can't live in that sense of ease here in this world? I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do. So all of a sudden, a purple butterfly flew by, and I said out loud to this butterfly, well, aren't you beautiful? And then I said, I looked around and I, I looked at everything and I said, now, why would I just say that to the butterfly when everything here is beautiful? And then everything came to life. Oh. Absolutely everything came to life with such joy that I saw it, that I united with it and understood the beauty of everything, the beauty of living, right? The beauty of being here. And I'm talking the rocks, the air, like everything. And so. But that's a moment of grace. That's yep. a moment of grace. You were in depression. I want to know, did that lift the depression permanently? Because I can hear people tuning in right now and they're saying, how do I have that experience? Yes, I get that a lot. Um, yeah. No, it did not um, resolve my depression. In fact, it made it more difficult because uh -huh. once again, here I have this exquisite um, understanding of life in a completely different way than I've ever known before. And, and, how do I talk about it? And to whom do I talk about it? Right? So what happened was I began to really struggle because these experiences started happening again and again and again, not, not prompted by a traumatic feeling of any kind. Oftentimes going into sleep or coming out of sleep or just walking down the street or sudden, re sudden really profound realizations. And so I had two very discordant worlds that did not match. So I began to, um, 
go to therapists and therapists and therapists and therapists and then Reiki practitioners and shamans and allopathic doctors or whatever, trying to understand what is happening to me? Why is this happening to me? I wasn't intending to do it. So how is this happening? And then what does one do with all of that information? You really tell that very well in your first book, Unwitting Mystic, which I'm holding on camera here for those watching on video. It's a, just an outstanding book and really makes clear what a challenging journey that was because more so these days you can find therapists who understand that there right. we are part of two worlds. But at the time you were finding people who I'm sure a few of them felt you're hearing voices and they're telling you, they're giving you these ideas of grandeur and self-importance. You're here to be, do something really important when in fact you are, we all are, yeah. but, uh, yeah, but that was hard to deal with. It was because it was in addition to failing to know what to do with all of this information, I also was failing to get help with all of that. And so it was just failure after failure, after failure, after failure, but understanding, you know, from a compassionate standpoint, the therapist didn't have the tools to work with someone like me. It's not like, you know, um, they were trained in mysticism. So, um, so all of that to say is yes, the, this, you know, it is, it is glorious to have these kinds of experience, but it is also, if you're not ready, it can be deeply traumatic. And so I was dealing with a lot of that trauma and ultimately all of that was just pushing harder and harder on my psyche. And then, as I mentioned earlier, my normal world fell apart and that just flipped my world upside down, which um, as you're aware, led to a really serious suicide attempt in um, 2011, now just over 10 years ago. And uh, because I just, I couldn't deal with it. I, could, I couldn't get any answers anywhere. And it was only after uh, that failed attempt, when I woke up two days after taking 97 pain and sleeping pills with three glasses of wine, and waking up into the exact same two worlds that I went to sleep in, that I finally just stopped trying to do anything. I just, I just surrendered in the most supreme way possible. And we speak a lot in our world about, you know, the importance of surrender, but I did not get there elegantly. I got there by defeat. Well, and that's uh, the way it is for so many when you hit that rock bottom. And exactly. it's just, it's very clear that you were meant to be here, that that attempt failed in your words, but it, you are meant to be here. And I just want to address briefly, so many people who listen to this show have loved ones who have uh, completed suicide mm -hmm. and are across the veil. And I know they're wondering why was theirs allowed to go through? And we just have to trust the bigger picture at times that life does not. And in fact, the message I got today from my guides again is that death is a, a doorway to another reality. And then of course, life is eternal. You and I know that. And yep. so some continue their life across the veil and you've continued yours here. We continue. Yeah, well, when you think about um, those people whose loved ones have passed and you are connecting them. So there's, they still remain as teachers, right? They're just teachers in a different format. So I've just remained as a teacher here. And so they bring us messages in a, in a very different way. And they're guiding people into a greater sense of understanding of possibility just from a different realm right? From different, different yeah. ways. So I think that's very important for people to understand. Yeah. Yeah. We have just two minutes before the break. You said you had dog-eared some specific passages from your book that take one minute each. Yeah. That was, yeah, sure. Is yeah. this a good time for an inspiring passage? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, in this book, I, often, I include every other chapter is a metaphysical experience. And so, this is one um, from the um, nunnery in India where I was living. Uh, this is just about what it, the awakening process. I'm awakened from a deep sleep at 424 a.m. with a powerful call to sit up and receive the following message. The time has come. Here I see a veil around earth lift and the air clear for all. Then the message continues. For those who know, those whose light will become visible to others, you have a responsibility now. Speak only your truth of love and nothing more, meaning do not embellish and trust your ability to speak from your higher self. 
This is very important for this is the integrity of light. You are the way. Understand with all your being that you know this and the way will be seen by others. Others will then awaken to their own choices. I watch now as a massive gathering of countless divine beings, masters, archangels, angels, etc., come together throughout the cosmos. They all watch in jubilant celebration as individual bodies of light begin to illuminate one by one around planet Earth. That's what we're doing. See, this is. message of yours, Mary, carries exactly the vibration of the messages I've been getting for years from my team, Sanaya. And they even showed us the same thing, that is each one of us, everybody, every one of you listening or watching now, comes to remember that we are all connected, to remember our true nature, your light burns brighter and we just turn up the light as a whole. That's and that it. was so beautiful and perfect. I know the guides guided us to do that just then because we're going to slide right into a break <laughs> and come back to hear more about this amazing awakening you had and how you've been sharing it with all of us. Beautiful Mary Reed. Come on back, everybody. We'll be back in just a few. Welcome back. You're listening to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Hey, I hope that you are sensitive enough to feel the divine loving energy that's just radiating off of Mary Reed here today. Mary, the description for today's show, I want to read it to everybody and then have you talk about it. It says, an unwitting mystic, which is the title of your first book, Mary Reed was shown that once we begin to remember our profound innate capacity for divine union and understanding, multiple dimensions of healing happen for us individually and collectively. So many people that enjoy this show would love to receive healing. Let's talk about that in relationship to what you've come to know. You know, um, the healing that I have both experienced and facilitated and witnessed um, is really a healing from very deep within and uh, within the collective, not just within the individual, but also the lineage of that individual and that individual's presence within the collective of humanity. We spoke earlier about the unit of consciousness. So, you know, when one thing happens, everything's affected, right? And um, all of this healing comes about literally from within, from the inside out and understanding one's truth, right? And, and, and understanding it in, with exquisite compassion and contextual, like how that's tethered to all these ways that we've suffered that those around us are suffering, that humanity is suffering, right? So all of this, when that happens, when there's that realization, that healing realization, there's like an opening suddenly, and you can just feel the relief. And it's a relief of a, a relief from suffering in some manner um, that, that really just um, ripples out, ripples out, ripples out. And then it just continues to ripple out. And that will create an, an aha or a realization about something else tied to that or whatever. So once it begins, once that door is open, then just all of this exploration of all the various ways that healing is at hand. And, now, I, and I say that- I want to interrupt you here because mm -hmm. I'm hearing a question, sorry. Yep. But people are asking, how do I open that door? Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a lot of conditioned ways in our life. We have ways that we have established how to feel comfortable or safe or normal or all the things that feel like we're, we can at least manage at this level. We realize that there may be some pain or, or um, suffering innate in us, but we've at least managed to get this way. But the conditioning by which we've done this in so many ways is to repress our capabilities, right? We've forgotten because we're managing in this separation consciousness. And uh, so when, as you know, when you are able to get really quiet, to really trust that silence, because so many people are afraid of that silence because they're, oh, yes. they're going to find out. Oh, I used to be. Yep. Yeah. But yep. you, you know from experience 
the exquisite compassion that's there. When we come to realize that we can trust that silence and the compassion that's there in the revealing of what comes through then. So a lot of my work um, comes from bringing people into a very, I can do this collectively. I have a weekly group that meets um, every, every um, Sunday night and I can do this individually in consultations, but it's about bringing people into a state of quiet, quiet trust and then receptivity. So they begin to discern that wisdom within them. And, and, you know, all we're doing in that is just sort of relaxing all that resistance to that, which allows things to just come through more and more and more and more. So that's the access to the healing wisdom that we're just uncovering all the things that have covered it up for so long. Beautiful. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier that you spent seven years in a nunnery mm -hmm. Tell us briefly how you got there and what resulted from being there. Um, well, you know, after my after I woke up from my suicide attempt and I was just defeated and I stopped trying to do anything, including trying to find help anymore. I remember literally sitting on my couch and saying, you know, God, you can see I have no idea what I'm doing. So if there's something that all of you need me to do, you're going to have to lead the way. I can't be the project manager for my life anymore. I can't do it. I don't know what to do. So in that beautiful state of I don't know, That's all the doors just started flying open. The I get crystal moments every show, and there's a big one right there. That's, <laughs> that, that's the key right there. Thy will be done, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So in that very deeply surrendered um, state, all the doors just started flying open. And the first door was to the perfect therapist who just picked me up, put me back together. And then she happened to train with somebody who's, he's a psychotherapist in DC. He runs the Washington Center for Consciousness Studies. Um, he happens to work in the field of consciousness with people like me. So she connected me to him. The two of them sort of bookended me and um, uh, lifted me up. And the Dr. Bauer, um, the psychotherapist, he uh, was the, on the host committee for the Dalai Lama's visit when the Dalai Lama was here in 2011. And he happened to sit next to somebody who was traveling with that contingent. Um, they exchanged phone numbers. He told me I should talk to this person and just, I don't ask for anything, just tell her my story. Because what we understood then was that I needed community. I felt, I had felt so alone for all Isolated. this time and I yeah. didn't have spiritual community. So uh, I just told this woman my story. I called her while she was in an airport. And um, after thinking it through, she invited me to India to meet with um, the 17th Karmapa, who is the man who is slated to take over as leader of Tibetan Buddhism when the Dalai Lama passes away. So she arranged a meeting. And uh, if I may interrupt. Yeah. That clearly shows that woman was tuned into higher guidance because you can see that all of this was spirit coming together. That's a, a God thing, a set up the web for her to pay attention and say, yeah, let's invite her to India to talk to this leader is no little thing. Yeah, it, it isn't a little thing. And I just want to, on that note, I want to say a note here about, you know, personalities in this journey, all of these various different kinds of personalities come around. And when we're just tuned into the, the truth of what's happening here and the, the alignment with what's in my highest interest, right? And trusting that, um, we can run into, we can feel that truth in lots of different personalities. This person was actually quite cranky. She was actually quite annoyed that I'd call her. She was inconvenienced or whatever, but, but, she called me back 30 minutes later after thinking about all of this stuff and then said, you know, I want you to think about coming for a long time because they may want to work with you. So just trusting that I shouldn't take offense at this woman or, you know, I shouldn't believe what she said. Right. So I just want to bring that out, uh, that, that wisdom and guidance can come in lots of different forms. Beautiful. Uh, so she invited me to um, India to meet with the Karmapa. I met with him. He gave me the guidance to stay and understand who I am. And by that, he meant, you know, who I really am, just connected to, to love, you know, as yes. love. Yeah. So that's how I ended up uh, living in the nunnery. I was uh, living in a very quiet, it's in the foothills of the Himalayas. And uh, yeah, so I was there. I would leave during monsoon season 
to, um, first of all, get out of the mess. And yeah. secondly, to go, once I've released my book, I would come on book tour. So, yeah. I remember reading a passage of your book to my husband, Ty, and saying, I give her a lot of credit. I couldn't do this because you said it was rather chilly out as you're inside in bed with, I believe, seven layers of clothes on. Mm -hmm. Not my idea of spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us uh, how the wisdom that you were receiving, that all of us can receive, changed over the years and your acceptance of it. Well, um, you know, the very confusing thing for me was that I was getting just these enormous chunks that didn't seem... They, there was commonalities to it, but I couldn't figure out how they all fit into like one great big picture, especially because I, I needed to talk about it, but it didn't have the words. You know, these are often talked about the realms of beyond words because they're just so vast. What words do you ascribe to those, right? Uh, so I really um, just stayed in kind of a state of confusion for a long time. But one time in India, uh, I had gone to the Dalai Lama's temple and there were all these statues there and one particular statue just suddenly when I looked at it I went right into the body and being of Buddha as a young man and yes. just saw so so perfectly his his compassion and all this stuff and then it, you know it was just this qu very quick but deep experience and that night when I laid down to go to sleep in the blink of an eye, I closed my eyes and everything came together. Like all of the pieces just went wow. into one big piece. And uh, I still didn't know how to talk about it, but at least I understood how it all fit together and mm -hmm. what I was doing here. And then uh, the, as every experience has happened since then, I understand how it fits in, how it complements, how everything goes together. Uh, so now it's, for me, it's all just... Um, you know, like a, a new, uh, an additional stroke on the big picture that I understand. And, and I, I'm quite at ease about talking about what it all means and where we're going and talking about specific issues within this awakening and all of that. Beautiful. So you are, now this is your mission. You've completely embraced it. This is what you do. Right. It is, you know, um, this is what I be, uh, you know, being is the new doing, right? Um, in one of the experiences, uh, the second experience that I ever had, uh, I found myself as suspended way up in the cosmos. And I said, as though the cosmos itself is speaking, I am the message. And I, you know, eventually I understood what that meant. I'm not here as a messenger. I'm here as the message. I'm not to give a message. I'm to be the message, right? And this is the, the message of embodiment, that we are embodying that which we truly are, all that we truly are, coming to life in this reality, in this experience. So that is what I do now. That is uh, the being of all of that. And I will add that when the pandemic started, when all of the energies were just started to really kick up in fear in particular, yeah. um, on April 2nd, 2020, which was just a few weeks into the pandemic, um, I, suddenly I began to channel. There was just this huge collective of um, light beings, divine beings, a whole arena full of them, which includes archangels and masters and all kinds of beings, just started to come in and ask me to yield. And then all of these beautiful teachings, helping everybody just stay calm and steady and grounding and understanding you know, that this is the part of the process of the awakening, that there will be this challenge to the old systems and finding the ways within our own being to remain, <clears throat> to remain steady and strong and developing that trust. This, bit bit. Was that the genesis of your, your second book, your latest one? Yes, the entire book, um, Divine New Being. This is it, and it is all transcripts from seven months of teachings that came out. I, I didn't know at the time that we were starting a series of teachings, um, but when it, you know, when we got to sort of the penultimate state, it was stunning. It was, and I did it all with my group. I channeled live with my group every week. I so have to, was, I have to give a shout out to Ty because there's a God wink right there that we're all on the, all connected. Because this morning he used the word penultimate, and he said, "Don't you love that word?" <laughs> I never use that word. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. I've never used that word. That's so funny. 
So this group of beings are called? Oh, consensus. I, I asked them, you know, what shall I call you? And yeah. they said, you can call us consensus. And they said that we are the amalgamation of the infinite number of ways a truth or truths can be conveyed. And that's not to be confused with uh, finding the lowest common denominator and considering that a consensus. On the contrary, it's the highest note possible. And the way that I experienced that highest note, as you can imagine, an arena full of thousands of these, these incredible divine beings, who, who, by the way, are very happy, very jubilant beings. Yes. And it's like they hit a tuning fork. And then there's that main vibration that goes through, and that vibration is what I voice. So that's what they mean by the highest note possible conveyed in the moment. So they always say, we're only here for what's happening in the moment. And then they give this beautiful, mm, beautiful teaching. Yeah. I call like it I said, that, that, that teaching, you come to the point where you recognize truth and you've tapped into it without a doubt. And it just, it's delicious to read just, your words. Thank you. And, uh, you have another passage for us, which while you find it in your book, from the first book, Unwitting Mystic, I just want to say that while Mary and I both agree that anyone can tap into inner wisdom, this kind of path of channeling higher guides and completely dedicating your life to, to being that voice, you're the message. And I, uh, I get that. It's very cool. Not everyone, that's their path. And you have chosen this beautiful passage from your book to share with us about the uniqueness of all of us. So I think it's perfect. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the joys of this is that I get to watch everybody bring their uniqueness into the world. And I celebrate that wholeheartedly because I see the divine presence in them. And uh, nobody, nobody in the entire history of the world has your unique perspective, has offers what you alone can offer nobody nobody in history has the suzanne giesman presence in the no world. i was just going to say you're talking to everybody everybody not just me yeah. no but nobody everybody. nobody who's listening or watching has your unique viewpoint lens gift to bring to the world this is so crazy it's not crazy it's just the way the web works that i just gave that message last week in, in an email message i sent out that everyone <laughs> is unique and all are special. And here you bring this message today. Love to hear what's in your book. Yeah, good, good. So at the beginning of our sessions every week, um, I give some introductory remarks. I talk about, you know, what I'm sensing or whatever, and then consensus will come in and give its teaching. So in the beginning of this particular um, teaching, I had talked about um, the use of colors um, at this particular stage in the teachings, the mind was getting a little involved or whatever, and the, the power of colors to help us kind of center or whatever. So there was a whole conversation about colors, and I say that because we're going to talk about that a little, little here. So at the point where consensus comes in, they say, we are delighted to join this gathering this evening. We're most pleased that there was conversation leading into this about colors. That is fun. The idea of a colorful gathering is lively. It feels lively to each of us, to all of us. Our sense of color is much more vast, unfathomably so, compared to the human understanding of colors. There's a rich continuum of every shade, not just the shades of a continuum of color, but each shade has a shape. It has a particular movement. It has a particular beautiful pattern. It has a particular relationship with all that is around it. In the human world, we tend to think of color as a simple visual stimulus, when in fact, it is so much more. This is the way of everything, every sound, every person, every idea, every belief, every moment. You see, we're guiding you into the uniqueness of everything here, the glorious, wondrous uniqueness of everything, of all being. As you feel that recognition of the infinite uniqueness of all life, you can understand the precious nature of the transformation that is underway, that is heading towards everyone realizing this gift. All of humanity is awakening to that understanding. And as that awakening happens, we awaken into the celebration of that uniqueness. 
the wild embrace of that uniqueness. You can see why this time in humanity's evolution is so thrilling from the divine perspective. It's exhilarating because it's such a gift to realize the scale of such beauty, of such extraordinary possibilities. As, as you're reading that beautiful passage, I'm just feeling the energy, the flow, and the way spirit through you is teaching us that we're not stuck as only this limited viewpoint of us as a person in a body, but we can use consciousness, our very being, to take on different points of view, to become more than just this. Yeah. Yes, and, and at the same time, it also um, calls us into the recognition of the value of every single thing. And I want to say that specifically, including all the things in us that feel painful, that we've wanted to get rid of or whatever, that we've in some way or form or fashion tried to resist or reject, that every single one of these things has a unique beauty to them. They, they hold a unique perspective that's extremely helpful to us. That's, you know, when we come into compassionate relationship, they have, a, every single thing has a story to tell us, has a really healing perspective to offer to us. So that uniqueness applies to absolutely everything, including the uniqueness of what we're becoming as we're shifting. Yeah. We're, we're more unique today than we were yesterday. We're differently unique, right? What a different feeling that has when we look at our challenges and we look at what we call faults and say, that's part of my uniqueness. Is it aligned with higher truths and do I want to change it or not? Mm -hmm. Voice, Mary, I want to go over here back to your book before we run out of time. It caught my eye as we were beginning. Your title is Unwitting Mystic, but the subtitle is Evolution of the Message of Love. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Well, you know, the, the, as you know, the, the book talks, the book alternates between my personal life and the metaphysical experience. So I take readers through what it is to evolve into the realization. Truly, this is the process of self-realization, right? So it's evolution of me realizing the, the message, the message realizing what it is in and of itself. And I, I just want to say, isn't that everybody's path? Yes, we're exactly. all here, all yes. here. Yes, exactly. The evolution of the message of love. Exactly. And I just want to say a note about love. Um, when, because people can think, you know, it's quite complicated or it's hard to get to a place of like being able to just love everything. Um, but I simplify it by thinking about very simply, what does love know how to do? What is the nature of love? It's only one thing. And that's to love, right? The, it only knows yeah, how to love. Connection. Anger knows how to be angry. Fear knows how to fear. Judgment knows how to judge. Love knows how to love. So when we, when we ask the question, how am I showing up here for myself or for others, if I'm intending to, to show up in love, then just aligning with what does love know how to do? It doesn't it doesn't call into the question whether somebody's worthy of it or a right or wrong. That's all moot. All love knows how to do is to love. And so when you settle into the simplicity of love's nature, it just makes it so much easier. It really simplifies everything. Yeah. Try that, everybody, and see how it changes things for you. <laughs> Speaking of that, you have a brand newly designed website. I was on it before the show started. It, it radiates your beautiful energy and your URL is love Mary Reed. That's almost like a double entendre there. Please everybody <laughs> love Mary Reed because she's awesome. <laughs> but love is Mary Reed. It's just a great, great address to have. Uh, let me just say where we got that. Um, that's actually the name of a movie that's that's being developed based on my book. And that the reason we chose that is that's the signature on my letter to my loved ones the day of my suicide attempt. I uh, send it love, Mary Reed. And so that's actually the origin of, of that. But anyway, I'm very happy with that website. The, the uh, web developer who worked with me was um, stunning on it. So thank you. 
Um, and can I mention that people can go there um, to find either of these books? Um, they're there. The audio books for both of these are coming, okay. um, should be out next week. And then they can find out more about my community as well, if they're interested in being part of my beautiful weekly community. I also do private retreats, consultations, you know, things like that. All of that is on there. Beautiful. So as we come down to the end of the show here, most people, I hope, would like to change and our our world for the better, help us all get along better and improve the world. Even though there, if we focus on the beautiful parts, there are many of those already. What is a good first step for listeners to take? Uh, for listeners to take to what? Transform our world from their place. Mm. You know, um, every single Sunday at 7.30, I gather with a group. And when we start to go into a meditative state, I always say, we are here in service. We are here in service to ourselves, to each other, to all of the collective of humanity and to our divine family. And I think that intention alone is so helpful to ground us and remind us of all that it takes as a willingness, right? Really centering ourselves in the willingness to be of service. So of course we wanna be of service. Of course we want to be of service. First of all, to ourselves, secondly, to each other, and then to all of the, and, and it's all one and the same, right? There's no difference of I'm doing something different when I'm doing it for them and I'm doing something different when I do it for me. No, in a unitive being, a unitive consciousness, love is love. And it radiates simply in that precious being, no matter where we're directing it, inward, outward, doesn't matter. Beautiful. We have less than one minute. Final words from Mary Reed. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think I just want to use this opportunity um, to say, first of all, thank you, Suzanne, for all that you do. And to all of the people that listen, because they're in the same wavelength, they are oh, yeah. of that same intention to want to realize all that we are um, on, not just for our own being, uh, not for our own behalf, but on behalf of all humanity. So thank you to, ev to you and to everybody who's uh, taking part in this in whatever way. Well, thank you. I love that word realize because it's a double meaning as well. We want to realize who we are and realize to make real the love that's inside us in our world here. So yeah. please, everybody visit Mary's website, lovemaryread.com and check out her books and see what I'm talking about when I say that you can feel truth when you read it. Thank you, Mary. You all have a blessed week and we'll see you back here next week.